the CNBC app. Global market news in one place. Customizable sections and personalized alerts. Stocks tracking, interactive charts and market insights all in your hands. Stay connected. Stay informed. Download the CNBC app today. We are live from Paris and London. Here are your headlines. Tesla CEO Elon Musk criticizes U.S. President Joe Biden's tariffs on Chinese EVs, telling me here at VivaTech they do just fine without them. Tesla competes uh, quite well in the market in China uh, with no tariffs um, and uh, no differential support. Um, so, uh, I sw- in general, I'm, I'm in favor of, of no tariffs. French President Emmanuel Macron on the record telling CNBC exclusively, Europe must double its efforts or risk losing out in the global AI race. France should be one of the leaders in, um, in this field. We multiplied by, by 10 in 10 years the scale of our ecosystem in, uh, in tech. And when you take the difference between US and Europe, we are lagging behind. Nvidia shares jump, but it's not enough to stem the tide on Wall Street after fresh data points to resilience in jobs and manufacturing. That said, here in the United Kingdom, a very downbeat set of retail sales could add to the downward pressure for European equities. And elsewhere, the US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen calls for greater coordination between G7 countries in a bid to tackle Chinese overcapacity. We need to stand together and send a unified message to China so they understand it's not one, just one country that feels this way, but that they face a wall of opposition. Um, This couldn't be worse timing for the UK government, which is trying to uh, go to the country on the 4th of July on the basis of its record in government on the economy and the bounce back, supposedly, in the UK economy. For a consumer-based and service-based economy, this doesn't look like a a bounce back. Look at this. UK retail sales in April, ex-fuel down 3% year on year. Reuters was going for negative 1.1%. The April retail sales figure you can see on your screen on a a month-by-month basis down 2.3%. Reuters poll was going for negative 0.4 month-on-month. April retail sales down 2.7% year-on-year. The only solace perhaps for um, the government may be the fact that it might force the hand on or or make the hand a little bit shakier uh, over at the MPC, thinking whether they need to cut sooner rather than later in the June meeting as well. But these are are, are woeful figures in terms of what was expected on UK retail sales. Moving on though, again, something that might boost uh, the UK consumer is the fact that the Ofgem, which is the UK regulator on utilities, has just released its lower price cap as expected, saying energy bills though um, will be circa £1,522 over the course of a year. Uh, that's uh, on prepayment, I should say. Meter for dual fuel uh, will pay 1522 But the overall price cap will fall by 7% from the 1st of July to the 30th of September 2024. And we'll bring you the latest on that snap general election at 9.45 Central European time. Savanta's political research director, Chris Hopkins, will join us. Karen, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Steve. A terrific engagement here with Elon Musk. And now Musk insists he doesn't support the Biden administration's tariffs as we talk about those newly announced ones on Chinese electric vehicles, adding Tesla is competitive without government incentives. This after Washington slapped a 100 percent border tax on Chinese EVs in response to what it said was unfair trade policies by Beijing. Well, I uh, did speak to Elon Musk at a virtual event here at VivaTech. I asked the Tesla CEO how trade tensions will impact his plan to bring a low-cost car to market. Neither Tesla nor I asked for these tariffs. Um, I, in fact, I was surprised when they were announced. Um, you know, t- Tesla competes uh, quite well in the market in China uh, with no tariffs um, and uh, no differential support. Um, so. Uh, I sw- in general, I'm, I'm in favor of, of no tariffs. Um, I'm, I'm also actually in favor of no um, uh, tax incentives uh, for EVs, but, but provided that there are also the tax incentives for oil and gas must also be eliminated. 
So I'm in favor of, of no tariffs and no incentives for electric vehicles or for oil and gas. And if, if they're all taken away, I think that would be for, for the best. Well, Tesla has reportedly cut output of its Model Y in China by a double-digit percentage amount uh, this since March. That's according to Reuters, citing data from the China Association of Automobile Manufacturers and an unnamed source. The data reportedly shows Chinese Model Y production fell by a third in April compared to a year ago. Plenty of conversations taking place here. Emmanuel Macron has also told CNBC engagement with China is crucial if the West wants to solve global challenges such as on defence and climate change. The French president said China is a partner as much as it is a rival. This is a competitor. Second, it's a rival in terms of values. When we speak about human rights, we don't have the same values and we have big disagreements. But third, this is a partner as well and we need them. And, and it's impossible to fix climate change. It's almost impossible to fix as well as a big geopolitical crisis without engaging with China. And I think this is why we have to clarify our agenda in terms of trade and be clear and, and respectful, but uh, defend our interests when we speak about this disagreement and trade and economy. But we have to do our best to engage them on the big issues of this world. Look, I mean, if the US didn't engage in 2015 with China, just forget Paris Agreement. US jobless claims saw their biggest week-to-week -week drop since September, falling to 215,000 and unwinding the jump seen at the start of the month. Meanwhile, PMI data showed US business activity expanding at its fastest level in two years, pointing to ongoing economic resilience and throwing the timeline for that first Fed rate cut further into doubt. Um, Arabile, so much going on. Data versus NVIDIA is the way it's been typified in various copies. It's the first thing I thought of this morning as well is NVIDIA, fantastic, but over 400 stocks in the S&P were in negative territory yesterday. Yeah, and you actually see that as the reason why you're seeing the overall market still manage to go uh, lower than in yesterday's trade. In fact, the broader market then going down uh, 7 excuse me, seven-tenths of a percent there uh, in the red across the board. The Dow Jones Industrial having its worst day in over a year as well. But it was that NVIDIA effect that uh, eased, let's, uh, let's say, the losses then for the NASDAQ. It managed to rise 9% by the close of trade yesterday. Three major elements here. Strong outlook, an earnings beat. Let's not forget that 10 for 1 stock split as well. All of that aiding that stock significantly higher. Across the week as well, uh, you're seeing some losses uh, in a lot of these. The Nasdaq uh, setting up for a fifth positive week, but some of the others, the Dow as well as the Nasdaq in the red. Asia market picture, then negativity here, more than 1% loss for both the Hang Seng as well as the Nikkei. Then just speaking about the Nikkei, Japan's market, then the Bank of Japan's governor, uh, Kazuo Ueda, saying that the economy was on track for a moderate recovery. Now, saying that yesterday ultimately means that even just one print, perhaps, which may not necessarily look too good, won't take away the chances of hiking interest rates in future then out of Japan. The Shanghai Composite is down a third of a percent. Out of Europe then, yesterday's market was slightly higher. Traders digesting the Fed minutes just a little bit more out of Europe. Sectors a little bit mixed. Tech stocks managing to move higher, 1% there. Again, the NVIDIA effect playing into the European market. Utilities did, however, drop 2.8%, Steve. Super. Let's get to Carl Hammer, who is uh, Global Head of Asset Allocation at SEB. Carl, um, you're generally constructive at the moment. Um, that's the way it looks from your copy as well. But you say strong outlook, but awaiting central bank clarity. Don't we have yes. central bank clarity, Carl? I.e., yes, rates are going down is what they're all pretty much saying. But you're just going to have to wait as opposed to the Rix Bank and uh, the SMB, which have already moved already. But, but they, they've given us clarity. Inflation's sticky, but we are on a southerly direction. Or, or am I missing something? No, you're correct, but the, there's the uncertainties around the US picture, of course, and it's going to be interesting in, in the coming weeks and running up to the Fed meeting uh, mid-June, uh, how they will balance, of course, the trajectory we have now with still stick inflation and, uh, and some weakening momentum in growth. I think the picture in Europe is, is much more clear and, and naturally so, because growth is, is weak and inflation is, is coming lower, especially so in Sweden, where there's, uh, you know, inflation will undershoot the target in the second half of this year. So I think from that perspective, it's, uh, it, it would be good to have some clarity on how Fed 
views near term monetary policy. And I think that that is one of the uncertainties we we see, given that markets has rallied substantially already this year as well. Yeah, I, I don't feel sorry for the Fed because they're, they're very highly paid men and women who um, have got a lot of experience behind them. But the fact of the matter is, it's confusing out there. When I, I look at the, the weekly jobless claims, fantastic figure. I look at the PMIs, really solidly good. And then I see a sort of story like Starwood Capital limiting redemptions because of their struggling property fund. I can't help thinking, is there a canary in the coal mine here somewhere as well? But, but your thoughts, sir? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not that concerned, to be frank, on I think the balance sheet in general is, is strong. We're seeing pockets of, of uh, weakness when it comes to the elevated rates. And, and surely, I mean, rates are in the restricted territory and will start to have an effect on the economy. But it's coming from strong, very strong level. And, and the momentum is, is uh, for a, uh, somewhat of a weakening uh, uh, pace of growth here. But, but so far, it's, it's, it's no alarm. And I, I'm just... From my perspective, being on, on a more sort of tactical note, I think, again, you could be a bit more neutral in a view on markets and, and we've come a long way and, and the market is, is surely positioned for, for a much stronger, uh, stronger outlook. Um, obviously, we need a moderation in growth in order to, uh, to be sure that inflation is coming down and the Fed ultimately going to cut rates. Um, so I think that that story holds still of, of you know, moderation in growth, opening up for rate cuts. And the strength this year is obviously incredible in terms of the repricing of central banks in general as well. And that's obviously a reflection as well that the underlying economy remains strong. Carl, there's so many interesting things you're saying there as well. Look, yesterday in the United States, you will be more aware than me, that it was a a stunningly mixed day. You you had 447 stocks in the the overall market uh, inclining, going up, and 2,387 going down. In the S&P, over 400 stocks were in negative territory. But, but you don't see that as much as you would do if, if, because of the, this technolo- technological bias as well at the top end, the NVIDIA-inspired bias. How much is that A, skewing the picture, and B, skewing your, your thought process about where to invest? Well, um, I mean, we've been overweighted the U.S. for a long time. We've actually downgraded the U.S. to neutral just this week because the uh, because of the valuation gaps. I think in general, for for me as a generalist and for all asset allocation people out there, you, you'll have to become a technology expert, and and it's it's it, it messes up your portfolio construction a bit when seven companies are so predominant, of course, and have such a high weight in in global portfolios these days. So. Um, I hear your point, and I, I think it's a it's a very valid uh, point to make. I think a lot of people in the market are looking for this theme of, of a broadening pickup, and and we uh, we have uh, run a small cap theme for quite some time in our portfolios, which has started to work now in in Europe and, and particularly in Sweden. In the US, obviously, it's 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 much tougher because um, rates are elevated and. And the smaller companies are much more interest rate sensitive. So, um, so, but that that is the theme that ultimately I think will play out. Um, the question is, of course, the timing on that when it comes to U.S. equities. Um, actually, I want to ask you about your bond allocation, if I may, briefly as well. I'm looking at you, the high yield bonds, IG. In fact, the whole curve because for, for in corporate bonds are so tightly priced above sovereign. I worry that there's a shoe to drop, and that goes back to my initial concern about that REIT I mentioned in the introduction. Carl, are you comfortable with your corporate bond allocation at the current tight pricing? I, I, I think that's also a very fair point, and we don't have any projection for, for a sort of a significant uh, spread tightening from here. I think the way we see it is that we, because we have a, a fairly positive outlook for the economy yet, and, and you know default rates are, are behaving Okay, etc. We we will maintain this view for some time, but obviously, if the economy was to 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 make a quicker turn to the downside, we we would change that. I think also, you know, we we've been underway to government bonds for quite some time in in Europe. Um, if you look at Sweden and, and other parts of Europe, um, the long end of the curve is is trading at at very low yield levels, which I I don't think ultimately will hold. Um, so. On the other hand, we, we think that the US 10 year is, is topping out somewhere between 450 and, and 5%. Let's see if that's right or not. But so there is a case ultimately um, for, for making a switch in, in the portfolios. But, but that is as it is right now, we're, we're getting the extra running yield from, from having this position, cool. which, which I think will work. 
Um, let's have another chat on another occasion because I'm fascinated in picking your brain a little bit more, but I have to leave it there. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Have a fantastic weekend, Carl. Uh, Carl Hammer, who is a global head of asset allocation at SEB. Coming up on this show, US regulators taking a step towards Ether ETFs, fueling hopes from crypto advocates of easing regulatory pressure. We'll bring you the latest next. Ambition to me is about doing better. I think ambition creates a pathway. The best advice I can give someone starting off a career is don't have a career, have lots of careers, try loads of different things. Talk to people and put your ambition out there. I don't feel that I've hit peak ambition because it's a learning journey. CNBC is where ambition meets opportunity. What does living ambitiously mean to you? Hear it from our CNBC anchors, reporters and global business leaders on CNBC.com. Welcome back. The SEC has approved rule changes uh, paving the way for the launch of spot Ether ETFs, the world's second most traded cryptocurrency. It surged in recent days after regulators gave feedback on the pending applications. Monday, uh, with ETF issuers now awaiting a second round of approvals before launch. Shares of Live Nation closed almost 8% lower after the US Justice Department announced a lawsuit seeking the breakup of the company over alleged antitrust violations. The Ticketmaster parent stands accused of suffocating competition and holding a monopoly in the industry. Live Nation called the allegations, quote, absurd. Live Nation President Joe Burke told, uh, told CNBC there is no evidence that the company is driving ticket prices higher. There is no basis for saying that the ticket prices are higher because of any of our conduct. What the DOJ has done is, is they've taken a variety of random data points and put it together to create a thesis that we're somehow creating higher ticket prices. The ticket prices are driven in the marketplace by what the artist needs, given today's production costs, given what they see in the secondary is the value of their show, what a fair price will be. Uh, this is fascinating, this next story. So let's go into a bit of detail. Starwood Capital has limited redemptions from one of its property funds as it faced a surge of withdrawals from investors amid weaker liquidity. The $10 billion Starwood Real Estate Income Trust will limit redemptions to 0.33% of net assets a month from as much as 2%, with the curb set to stay in place for six months to a year. Starwood Capital CEO Barry Sternlicht said he believes real estate markets are bottoming out and any sale of assets would negatively impact all investors. I think this is a fascinating story for many reasons. One, what's going on at Starwood specifically, but more importantly for our viewers, is this a canary in the coal mine for the bigger industry problems, for bigger leverage problems out there, for a broader corporate refinancing story going forward, and, and indeed what is going on with the underlying property market. So finance levels, um, broader property market concerns about the real industry, uh, and also how susceptible this industry is to higher for longer on the US interest rates as well. Um, just, just some fascinating data within there as well uh, about the, um, the portfolio. It spans apartment blocks in Arizona, logistics centers in Norway, yep. uh, a large loan it was uh, provided to Blackstone for the acquisition of Australian hotel and casino group Crown Resorts. So they got their fingers in a lot of pies. Yeah, they certainly do, Stephen. And, and, and you're quite right that one of the issues is just going to be about that property sector. But I also want to just make note that they're not the only ones. You know, if you just if you really just go into the space, um, the queue for redemptions, and this is just an article actually from the 5th of April, so a month ago now, yep. right, saying that the queue for redemptions from the open-ended UBS Trumbull Property Fund stood at 60.4% of the fund's $10.8 billion uh, net asset value at the end of 2023. So there, it's clearly happening a little bit more. Is it a systemic and a, and a wider issue? We don't know as yet, but it certainly is something that could could be bubbling under and could create worry. Where is this? That's the question as well. Yeah. Where in the private market sector is this as well? I mean, looking at the data, which we haven't spent a lot of time on um, so far this week, because there's been so much going on, is that the housing data as well. Yeah. Uh, and new home starts in the second quarter were weak again. We had underwhelming existing home sales data. But the problem is, in terms of a lot of mortgage applications and activity, is because of the high price of land, yeah. high price of the properties, and high price of the financing. 
housing. So you've got those three issues there as well, which are blighting the industry. The, the, the question is, why prices are still so high when there is so much stress in the industry as well? And if he says they're bottoming out, yet on the, a different side of the equation, prices remain so sky high as well. It's a stunningly mixed and complex market, not all CRE, not all um, uh, real estate for the, the private sector and the, 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 um, for individuals yes. is at sky high prices. It's a very mixed market as well with different grades of property. But it just shows you there's a lot of tensions mm. beneath the surface. Tensions that we've talked about for a year or so, yeah. but actually haven't really um, haven't gone to higher delinquencies. There's not higher problems with bank balance sheets either. Sure. So it's not just about the real estate sector. It means what it means for the financiers behind it as well. Yeah, but I mean... To some extent, Barry Stern like, has to, however, say that he feels like it is bottoming out. And Absolutely. Because yeah, he kind of has to talk that book up a little bit and just to ensure that people remain calm somewhat too. But there's the other worry, right, is the ability to raise money in order to pay some of those redemptions as well in this market. I mean, he, he just makes note of if he has to put out $500 million, he would actually have to sell assets worth $1 billion. So that gives you... A, a, a clear worry on that front. Uh, even on the other one that I had made note of, the UBS Trumbull uh, Fund as well, the inability to sell assets quickly has limited UBS's ability to meet those redemption requests. So there's even that other side, being able to sell those is, is a Did key you say question. UBS, sir? It's, the, it's the other one, of course, that I'd make note of earlier, that it was the open-ended UBS Trumbull Property right. Fund, which stood at 60.4%, the queue for redemption. Okay, on that super. One. So just something for our viewers to be aware of. It might just be a star -like, Starwood issue, actually, or there may be concerns in a broader issue, yeah. the higher that interest rates remain high in the United States and elsewhere, and of course the leverage implications for many of these players as well. Uh, coming back to this side of the Atlantic, UK consumer confidence hits its highest level since December 2021. This month, as consumer price inflation fell to within a touching distance of the Bank of England's 2% target, and as a minimum wage hike and tax cut came into effect, the figure jumped two points, but is still way below the flat line at minus 17. Nevertheless, it represents some good news for the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, ahead of the summer's snap election. So, yeah, consumer confidence mildly better, but that's not translating into better sales as well. And I'd imagine the retailers in the United Kingdom are actually going to get under a lot of pressure today. April retail sales down 3% year on year as opposed to expectations of negative 1.1% the monthly figure negative 2.3% as opposed to Reuters expectations of negative 0.4 of 1%. Right, let me just show you some pictures we're getting out of uh, Streza in Italy. Uh, the finance minister of France is speaking. Is he speaking in English? He's in French at the moment, so we'll just hold off for the moment from that as well. But fascinating uh, listening to that interview that Andrew Ross Sorkin uh, had with the French president, Monsieur Macron, as well, talking about the competitive position of Europe on uh, AI type products, on technological products as well. And actually was asked about uh, potential takeover activity and how France would be um, if there is more takeover activity of French technological companies uh, in that area as well. But um, be interesting to see with, uh, we can come off Monsieur Le Maire until he's speaking English if you like. Um, but yeah, again, competitive problems for Europe once again. I and mean, this is the United States, on the other, uh, which is an ally, but is spending far more money incentivizing companies to grow in the US, whether it be Chips Act, whether it be IRA, whether it be other initiatives as well. Yeah, so that incentivization on the one side, on the US or the state side, is happening quite significantly. The questions that even uh, our colleague, of course, Karen and, and Arjun have been asking, whether you need more regulation, whether you need a little bit more to actually come into play for the market even in Europe to actually get the same boost, the same pickup. But then there's obviously the worry that you have the likes of China who do have that pickup then as well. And then how does the relationship between the United States and those competitors then fare at a later stage? Yeah, it's very interesting because um, the prospective Republican candidate, Donald Trump, has yeah. talked very much about putting Europe in the same bracket as China. Exactly. Uh, and yet you've seen Janet Yellen, uh, the Treasury Secretary, talking about um, potentially aligning European policy yeah, with the US. Europe have the same worries as we the United States. We need to get out to Bruno Le Maire, who I understand is taking questions in English as well. Why is that G7 strategic? Because it's taking place at a decisive time from a geopolitical and economic point of view. The world economy is back 
on the right track after the COVID and the inflation crisis. We should nevertheless bear in mind that geopolitical risks have become the most significant threat to growth and to our economies. And this threat raises a number of questions to which we want the G7 to provide common answers. Unity is our best asset. The first uh, challenge is to define fair trade rules with China. And it will be, of course, one of the points that will be discussed among the G7 members. China is our economic partner. But China has industrial overcapacities. And the G7 must present a united front to protect its industrial in interests. All the instruments at our disposal must be used, whether it is at the G7 level or at the European level, to protect our industrial interests and to protect ourselves from unfair trade practices. The second message, as I explained to you, is of course the financial support for Ukraine. We will discuss the different options for using the windfall profits of Russian frozen assets. We did it at the European level for 2024 with an innovative, ambitious, and efficient mechanism. We now want to use the G7 meeting in Stresa to define a common position on the best option for using those windfall profits for the year 2025 and beyond. The key challenge is to ensure the right financing for the Ukrainian government. The third thing that will be discussed is, of course, international taxation. You know that I've been fighting to reform the international taxation system for more than seven years now. And I really intend to fight with the same determination for a minimum taxation of the wealthiest people in the world. It's a question of justice. It's a question of efficiency. We are not there yet, but I will spare no effort to get there. It is no longer acceptable for the wealthiest to escape taxation, and everyone, everyone must pay their fair share. In conclusion, at a time of great geopolitical instability, the G7 must show its unity <coughs> on all these strategic issues, whether it is trade unfair practices, financial support for Ukraine, or international taxation. It is the unity of the G7 that guarantees the impact of its decisions, it is this message that I will convey today in Sreza. Thank you for listening to Squawk Box Europe Express. For more market-moving news, you can head to cnbc.com. Or join us again on the show with Steve Sedgwick, Karen Cho, and myself, Arabi Lekomete, weekdays on CNBC.